Hello everyone, welcome to Atoms and Sporks, and in this video I want to talk about how light can have momentum. Or to put it another way, how can light push? Now, the fact that light exerts a force on things is something that isn't always realized. Part of the reason for this is because in a first exposure to physics, you know, in a high school physics class or whatever, the way that momentum is presented makes it seem like it should be impossible for light to have any. Well, later in this video, we'll actually talk about that specifically, and why an introductory physics class may have misled you there. However, the other main reason is quite simple. We really don't notice this push of light in everyday life. I mean, when you open your fridge, you don't feel like some repulsive push when the little fridge light turns on. Or when we step out into sunlight, we don't feel like we're like being pushed to the ground. And the reason for that is simply because the push of light isn't very strong in those cases. And you can see why just by looking at the very simple formula for how strong this push should be. To figure out the pushing force, you take the optical power per unit area and divide it by the speed of light. And the thing is, the speed of light is kind of a huge honking number. It's 300 million meters per second. So if you take something and divide it by a very, very big number, like 300 million, you're going to get a very, very small number. Take, for example, the push of sunlight on a bright day. Well, at high noon, the sun is hitting the Earth's surface with about 1,000 watts of power per square meter. So each little square meter is being blasted with a thousand watts of light. Well, the force due to that light is about a third of a millionth of a newton. In terms of comparison, if you spread out the weight of a single solitary grain of sand over that whole meter squared, just one grain of sand, that grain's weight would push down over 30,000 times harder than the push of sunlight on a bright day does. So the push is tiny, and that's why we don't notice it. However, just because it is small does not mean it's not important. Another name for the push of light is radiation pressure, and it plays a key role in both the cosmos and in a number of human technologies. In fact, one of the first people to suggest that light could push was Johannes Kepler, who some 400 years ago suggested it because he noticed that the tails of comets always pointed away from the sun. No matter where a comet is in an orbit around the sun, its tail always points away from it. And based on that observation, Kepler correctly concluded that sunlight itself must be pushing the tail away. And that's true. He was right. That is the reason comet tails do that. The radiation pressure, you know, light's push, also plays a big role in applying rotations to smaller objects in our solar system, like dust and asteroids, as well as affecting their orbits. Depending on things like shape and orbital direction, radiation pressure can take something like an asteroid and spin it, or spiral its orbit inwards, or actually push it outwards. There are a number of these effects, for example, the Yarkovsky effect, or the yarkovsky okeefe radzivsky Paddock effect, which, by the way, is called the Yorp effect for short. That is, like, j just the best name for an effect. Yorp. Anyways, probably the most important role radiation pressure plays in the universe is holding the stars themselves together. It's probably not like a big shock to anyone to say that stars are made of a lot of stuff. And all of this stuff, this mass, is being pulled inwards by its own mutual gravity. And if that was all that was going on, if there was no outward force to counteract this, this gravitational collapse would result in just black holes, and stars themselves would not exist. However, as this gravitational compression happens, the interior of the body gets hotter and hotter. And this heating and compression leads both to an outward gas pressure, but also to nuclear fusion. Now, for smaller stars, it's mostly this gas pressure from having all this hot gas that is pushing outwards and resisting gravitational collapse. However, in the largest stars, whose interiors are the hottest, it's actually the thermal radiation of light associated with this heat that is doing most of the pushing. In other words, the most massive stars in our universe avoid their own collapse via the push of light. And it is these stars, by the way, that are responsible for ultimately creating most of the elements that fill our universe. But okay, so radiation pressure pushes comet tails around and spins and pushes around asteroids and it keeps stars alive, but those examples may seem quite removed from life on Earth. 
But the push of light isn't just important to the cosmos, it's also something humankind has exploited technologically. One class of ways we exploit it is by recognizing that even though the radiation force exerted by man-made light sources like lasers is quite weak, if we apply it to objects that are very, very small, its effect can still be significant. For example, in a previous video, we learned about optical tweezers, the technology that uses lasers to hold small microscopic particles and molecules in place and move them around at will using only light. Another example is how we can use the push of light to actually rob atoms of their own momentum and thereby cool them to temperatures near absolute zero. We call this laser Doppler cooling. However, our ambitions for applications of radiation pressure go beyond the microscopic. At the beginning of this video, I showed you this footage. This relates to the idea of using a planet-based laser to propel small probes off into space to explore the cosmos. The idea is for kind of a shotgun approach to space exploration. Make the satellites cheap and light and just blast a whole bunch of the suckers to a thousand different star systems. And of course you can flip things around and put the laser on the spacecraft itself and use it for propulsion by basically just shooting a beam of light at the back. However, if you run on numbers, that's probably the bolder and more Herculean task of the two. But anyways, the key point I hopefully convinced you of is that even though the momentum of light doesn't appear obvious in everyday life, it means a lot, both for our technology and our very existence. And speaking of the omnipresence of this effect, another thing I think it is important to understand is the fact that light having momentum is by no means new information to physics. If you thought the fact that light has momentum was maybe something we only learned about recently in physics, you know, maybe you might think it came out of quantum physics or cutting edge particle physics research or what have you. Well, no, it's, it's definitely not. I already talked about how Kepler had an inkling that light should do this over four centuries ago, but that was just a notion based on a single effect. However, pretty much immediately, when we started to actually understand electromagnetism and what light really was, it was clear that lights and electric and magnetic fields in general should hold momentum and energy. Furthermore, matter and materials are made of atoms, and atoms are made of electrical charges, like electrons and nuclei. And once we recognized that what light was, was a pair of perpendicular oscillating electric and magnetic fields, it was pretty easy to ask the math of electromagnetism what we expect to happen when such an electromagnetic wave hits a set of electrical charges, like atoms. I'm not going to go through the nitty gritty details, but the electric field should push the charges up and down, up and down, up and down. And thus, on average, it won't actually push it anywhere because it's pushing it up just as much as it's pushing it down. But it is giving it a velocity that is flipping directions back and forth. If you then ask what the magnetic force, the perpendicular magnetic field of the wave should exert on this charge moving back and forth, you will get a force. And it goes this way. And that's it. That's our radiation pressure, our push. And if that last section was super complicated, do not worry. I, I just wanted to quickly show explicitly that if you ask the physics of electromagnetism what should happen when an electromagnetic wave hits an electric charge, it says there should be a push in the direction the wave is moving. That's just physics from the mid 19th century. The point is, we've known of and understood this effect for at least a century and a half. It's old physics. And even if one looks to the more modern quantum mechanical theory of light, things are the same. But that brings us to the last thing I want to talk about, which is that if you ever took a basic physics class, you probably learned that momentum is equal to the mass of an object times its velocity. Momentum is generally notated with a P, by the way, for reasons. But anyways, and what you also learned is that light is related to photons, and photons have no mass. So if you learn that, then there's an issue, because based on these two facts you learned, it shouldn't be possible for light to have momentum, because by this equation, its momentum should be zero. 
Of course, even if one might think that light has no momentum, I think it's probably pretty obvious and self-evidently true to everyone that light does carry energy. I mean, just think of something like solar panels, which extract usable power from sunlight. We know if we focus sunlight, we can burn things and create fires, and not to mention the fact that sunlight drives dangerous biochemistry in our bodies that results in things like sunburns and skin cancer. But then that's sort of a contradiction, because in the same physics class, where you learn that momentum is equal to mass times velocity, you probably learn that connection kinetic energy of something is equal to half its mass times its velocity squared. Or maybe you learned probably the most famous equation there is, that the rest energy of a particle is equal to its mass times the square of the speed of light. C is the speed of light, by the way. So what the hell? Both our momentum and our energy equations all seem to say that you gotta have mass to have any of this stuff. And I mean, it's, it's E equals mc squared, man. That's like a big equation. And there it is. M. Mass. So what gives? Well, Einstein was wrong. Nah, no, no, I'm kidding. Rather, this isn't the real full equation. The real equation is this. E here is energy, P here is momentum, M here is mass, and all these Cs are just constants, our speed of light again. So we can kind of just ignore those because they don't tell us much. But with this, we see that the energy of an object is dependent on its mass and its momentum. But I mean, how can a bajillion novelty coffee cups and neckties and posters and I think I even saw some E equals MC squared underwear once be wrong? Well, if we look at this equation and we imagine the special case where we do have something with mass and we're kind of just moving along beside it, we're in the so-called rest frame of the object, then its momentum is zero because we're in its rest frame. And under those specific assumptions, this equation reduces to the famous E equals mc squared. And let's face it, this simplified form is nice, it's pithy, and it's much easier to fit on the side of novelty toilet paper. In a similar vein, these equations you might have learned from momentum and kinetic energy, these come from this equation under the specific assumption that you are talking about something that does have mass, and whose speed is much less than the speed of light. You might wonder how they come from this, but honestly, it's a bit of a slog calculation, requires you to know something about special relativity, but trust me, it's in there. So with the true equations in mind, we see that if light has no mass, which it doesn't, then we have the rather tautological or circular results that its energy is proportional to its momentum. So with the true equations, if you buy that light has energy, then it actually must have momentum. So in summary, these equations are only simplified results under the assumption that you're dealing with something with mass. They're not the full real equations. When you do use the real equations, you see that a massless object has both energy and momentum. And with that, let's close things off and recap. Firstly, we looked at some examples where radiation pressure, or the push of light, is important, both in astronomy and in technology. Then we briefly looked at how the natural prediction of the effect of an electromagnetic wave impinging on a bunch of atoms is to push on it, and that basically as long as we've known what light is, we've known that it pushed on things. And finally, we looked at why the equations for momentum and energy you may have learned in a basic physics class may have misled you on this issue. So yeah, light has momentum. Have a good one.